Uh, Madam President, I uh, first of all I appreciate your coming from your meeting to uh, to preside. I, as we begin the new Congress and a new administration, the, we begin a new chapter in energy and environmental policy, and it's it's time that the environmental activists, the United Nations, and many of my Democrat colleagues have been salivating for for years. The stars are aligned. The Democrats control both sides of Pennsylvania Avenue. The Supreme Court has uh, spoken out that carbon dioxide is a pollutant under the Clean Air Act, even though it was a 5-4 decision. It's kind of interesting how something can be a pollutant in a 5-4 decision. They believe that the stage is set for a home run on mandatory Kyoto-like climate controls and the dawn of a new bustling green energy economy. However, before many of my colleagues rush to leap before they look, I want to remind them of some very unfortunate developments that may complicate their early action item wish list. I ask my colleagues to at least consider some of the facts that I will be revealing over the next series of speeches and to keep an open mind before rushing to sweeping action after waiting for so many years. The scale and pace of the climate proposals and the regulatory actions we have debated in the past, including the recently failed Lieberman-Warner bill and the ones we will likely be debating this Congress, leave little room for error in this fragile, recession-ridden economy. And the inflated promises of a sweeping green jobs revolution needs an honest and frank reality. The proponents of mandatory global warming controls need to be honest with the American people. The purpose of these programs is to ration fossil-based energy by making it more expensive and therefore less appealing for public consumption. It is a regressive tax that imposes a greater burden relative to resources on the poor uh, than it does on the rich. Let me say that again. The purpose of these programs is to ration fossil fuel-based energy by making it more expensive to all Americans and therefore less appealing for public consumption. But it is a regressive tax, and we've studied, talked about this before. It is one that punishes those who are poor, those whose resources have to be used uh, for such purposes as, as uh, being able to operate their vehicles and heat their homes. Advocates may argue that the redistribution of wealth towards the income consumers will offset the balance of revenue or taxes being taken in, but we learned firsthand during the Lieberman-Warner debate this simply is not true. I, I don't like the argument that we have equal distribution of wealth efforts that are going to take a regressive nature out of, uh, of, of the, the punitive values of this, this type of a program. Uh, to me, there's something un-American about that. But while the bill's sponsors tried to convince us that there was actually tax relief in the bill, we learned that families, now I'm talking about the Lieberman-Warner bill. This is only about eight months ago. The Lieberman-Warner bill, uh, that families and workers would still have to pay $6.7 trillion into the system in the form of higher energy costs to get back an estimated $802 billion in tax relief. That's a return of $1 out of every $8.40 paid. It's time the proponents of, class, uh, of, of climate policies be honest. It's expensive and it's going to cost taxpayers a lot of money. You know, Mr. President, it doesn't really matter which form that we use. We've gone through, first of all, the Kyoto Treaty. We came this close to actually passing the Kyoto Treaty. And it wasn't until the Wharton School of Economics came along with the e econometric survey and they determined that it would cost some $300 billion a year to join on to and, and actually try to achieve the emission requirements of Kyoto. Then along came the McCain-Lieberman bill, and after that, the, uh, the Warner-Lieberman bill. And uh, uh, cap and trade is going to be about the same amount. The, they may massage it a little bit. We're still, still talking about in the neighborhood of $300 billion a year. That equates to over $2,000 for each taxpaying family in America. So it's a huge thing. In the coming weeks, I'm going to go into more detail about other false promises of proponents of mandatory global warming policies that they're advocating. Among them are a reality check on green projects 
the number of new green jobs from a climate regime are overstated compared to the number of manufacturing jobs lost. We know from the National Association of Manufacturers how many jobs would have been lost with any of these schemes in the past. A review of the weaknesses of offset policies. Companies have bought offsets which are not real. And a review of the attempts to estimate the cost of inaction. Many advocates are claiming that it is more expensive to do nothing than the cost of a cap and trade, but they are un untested in non-transparent economic modeling. All these issues will play a vital role in the debate on both energy and global warming policy, which have become unavoidably intertwined. You can't really talk about one without the other. You can't talk about uh, what you're going to do on um, greenhouse gases or CO2 or cap and trade without affecting our overall energy policy. When there are sensible proposals debated in Congress that can achieve double benefits of reducing emissions and making America's energy supply more stable, diverse, and affordable, then we'll look forward to working on a bipartisan basis to, ach uh, basis to achieve these goals. Increasing our domestic energy production and lowering our dependence on foreign oil are two issues that are critically important to myself and my state of Oklahoma. And of course, this would, uh, will include renewables and new green jobs. However, we need to be smart and realistic about these policies. Unfortunately, I fear that the scale and pace that many of my colleagues will be advocating for with mandatory climate policies are unrealistic, extraordinarily expensive, and are ill-advised. And what is the driver for these unrealistic proposals that seek to make unnecessarily abrupt and painful increases in our energy costs in the near term? It's all rooted in global warming science. I've given over 12 speeches, uh, averaging over an hour apiece on the science of global warming. Uh, over the past few years. And today I want to update my colleagues on some of the latest science that has not yet been reported in the mainstream media. I will simply be, uh, it be, be a disseminator of this information, not a commentator. I have to say that because, you know, I am not a scientist, uh, and uh, nor is anyone else that I know of in this body a scientist. So uh, the statements I will make will be quoting people who do are qualified and are scientists, and this is what uh, my role will be. Now, before I do that, I ask all my colleagues to think about the issue. Science should not be reviewed through any one frame. It is not partisan. It's not regional. However, the political process has largely engulfed the science behind climate change, and as I have documented in speeches before, the politicizing of the global warming science has become one of the most unfortunate developments in the last eight years. Anytime one questions a hypothesis or a conclusion that does not fall in line within the sky is falling doom and gloom scenario of global warming alarmists, it is ridiculed, written off, denigrated, and not reported by the mainstream media. Yet any time a more severe interpretation or alarming statistic is related, it is headline grabbing in the news. Uh, objective, transparent, and verifiable science gets lost in the public dialogue. Funding has a way of, of, of influencing this debate. Uh, you know, the other day there's an article in the in the Bloomberg News, and so I say this to those individuals who might be feeling sorry for Al Gore, that uh, it was reported that his net worth in 2000 was between one and two million dollars, and it's now in excess of a hundred million dollars a day. So he'll be all right. When the stakes of the policy outcomes with cap and trade and other mandatory climate proposals are this high for the American people. I hope that the Senate this year will embrace my cause for objectivity and transparency in science and modeling. As policymakers, it's our duty to ensure that models developed by agencies and used in policy are useful for their intended purpose, articulate major assumptions and uncertainties, and separate scientific conclusions from policy judgments. However, with global warming science, this has not been the case. With many left of center scientists, the environmental activists now realize that the so-called consensus on man-made global warming is not holding up. The left-wing blog Huffman, uh, Huffington Post, this is a left-leaning organization, surprised a lot of people by featuring an article on January 3rd of 08 by 
uh, Harold Ambler demanding an apology from Gore for promoting unfounded global warming fears. The Huffington Post, again, left-leaning, uh, the article accused Gore of telling the biggest whopper ever sold uh, to the American public in the history of mankind because he claimed the science was settled on global warming. The Huffington Post article titled Mr. Gore, Apology Accepted, adds it is Mr. Gore and his brethren who, brethren who are flat earthers, not the skeptics. Again, it is not myself, not Jim Inhofe saying this about Gore. It's the left-wing blog of the Huffington Post saying these things. The Post article co uh, continues, and I'm quoting now. It says, uh, let us neither cripple our uh, own economy by uh, mislabeling carbon dioxide a pollutant or discouraging development in the third world uh, where suffering continues unabated uh, day after day. Another left of center atmospheric scientist who has descended on the man-made climate fears is U the UK's Richard Courtney. Courtney, a uh, UN, uh, let's keep in mind when all this started. A lot of people forget. This was started by the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change. They came out and they said, oh, it's man-made gases, anthropogenic gases, CO2, methane, that are causing climate change. And uh, 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 this, this person used to be uh, on that, that panel. He was an expert reviewer and the UK-based climate and atmospheric science consultant is a self-described socialist who also happens to reject man-made climate fears. Joining Courtney are many of the other progressive environmentalist scientists, former Greenpeace member and, and uh, Finnish scientist Dr. Jarl Albeck, a lecturer of environmental technology and a chemical engineer at the University of Finland who has authored 200 scientific publications, is also uh, skeptical of man-made climate doom. Albeck wrote in 2008, quote, contrary to common belief, there has been no or little global warming since 1995. And this is shown by two completely independent uh, data sets. But so far, real measurements give no ground for concern about catastrophic future warming. This is kind of interesting because what he's saying, and this is a guy that started out with the United Nations, it was in at the beginning with the IPCC, that, um, that we're not even, right now, we're actually in a cooling period. I think no one debates that now. We've had the most severe weathers, and I have another talk I'm going to try to get in next week talking about what's happening around the country right now. It isn't global warming. It's global cooling. And we go through this. People forget that God's still up there, and we go through these cycles. I can remember in the middle, uh, the middle 1970s when uh, they were saying there's another ice age coming and we're all going to die. And those same people, and it was, um, there's an article in Time magazine at that time, are the ones now saying that it's, it's, we're going to die, but it's a, for a different reason. It's uh, global warming. Uh, lifelong liberal Democrat uh, Dr. Martin Hertzberg, a retired Navy meteorologist with a Ph.D. in physical chemistry, also declared his dissent of warming fears in 2008. He said, and I'm quoting now, as a scientist and lifelong liberal Democrat, I find the constant uh, regurgitation of the anecdotal fear mongering claptrap about human caused global warming to be a disservice to science. Uh, Hertzberg wrote, and finally, uh, in CNN, not a bastion of conservatism, had yet another of its meteorologists dissent from warming fears. Meteorologist Chad Myers, a meteorologist for 22 years, certified the, by the American Meteorological Society, spoke out against anthropogenic climate claims on CNN in December. Quote, you know, to think that we could affect weather all that much is pretty arrogant, Myers said. Mother Nature is so big and, and uh, the world is so big and the oceans are so big, I think we're going to die from a lack of fresh water or we're going to die from uh, some type of uh, uh, ocean uh, acidification before we die from global warming for sure. And that's a quote from uh, Myers. Myers joins a uh, fellow CNN. By the way, CNN has been very biased all this time. I think we know that, and as has the Weather Channel and others, because there's a lot of money in this, uh, this uh, uh, perpetuating this, uh, this myth. Myers is joined by his fellow CNN meteorologist, Rob Marciano, who compared Gore's film to fiction in 2007, and CNN anchor Lou Dobbs, who just said of global warming fear uh, promotion on January 5th, that's this year, 
uh, it's almost a religion without any question. Recently, I released a new report on climate scientists, which, is, uh, which documents many of the studies ignored by the mainstream media. Here it is right here. This is one that's actually too large to put in to the congressional record. In here, the report included 650 scientists who have challenged man-made global warming claims made by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We talked about that. I have been detailing these science issues for a number of years. In a July 28, 2003 floor speech in this chamber, I said the issue of global warming is far from settled and indeed is seriously disputed. The science continues to evolve. I explained that anyone who pays even cursory attention to the issue understands that scientists vigorously disagree over whether human activities are responsible uh, for global warming or whether those activities will uh, precipitate natural disasters. And I noted uh, that, and this is what I said in, in 2003, quote, not only is there a debate, but at least in certain corridors, the debate is shifting away from those who subscribe to global warming alarmism. Now that was in, 2000, in 2003. After that speech, I led the charge against the McCain-Lieberman Global uh, Warming Cap and Trade Bill. That would have been in 19, uh, 2003, then again in 2005. Uh, both uh, times easily defeating the bills. At the time, it was a lonely battle. Only a few people came down to help me on the floor. I remember so well in uh, 2005 when, uh, when I was alone down here on the floor for five consecutive days that we had it on the floor, some, about 10 hours a day. Very few people came down who were willing to join me on the floor. Now, that has changed. Uh, in, it, it, if you fast forward from 2005 to 2008, uh, we had the Warner-Lieberman uh, bill on the floor, and at that time, I had some over 25 senators come down and join me. So you're seeing people who no longer fear the money generated by the MoveOn.orgs and, the, and the, the Hollywood elitists and those individuals who have millions and millions of dollars to put into campaigns and to throw into the system. So uh, we're getting a lot of courage around that, that. Things have changed. In fact, at the end of the bill that we had that is referred to sometimes as the uh, either the Lieberman Warner bill or the Boxer climate tax bill, that they're only able to get about 37 people on their, from their own party from this side of the aisle over here that would support it. And that's a major change from the past. And after this election, that number's only gone up from 37 to, uh, to 39. So you're not getting close to the 60 votes that are necessary to try to inflict this economic damage on, on, um, on the United States. The Republicans were prepared to debate the bill. This is the uh, Warner-Lieberman bill. And we're ready to offer amendments. But the Democrats didn't want to debate, much less vote on, on our amendments that were aimed at protecting American families and workers from the devastating economic impacts of the bill. When faced with the inconvenient truth of the bill's impact on skyrocketing gas prices, it was Democratic senators who wanted to see the bill die a quick death. And by the way, we had a list of some, seven, uh, some 10 Democrat senators in a very responsible way said, well, we'll go ahead and vote on some of these amendments, but when it gets down to final passage, we are not going to vote on it. The, um, after the bill failed, the Wall Street Journal uh, aptly noted that environmentalists are stunned that their global warming agenda is in collapse. The paper added, and I'm quoting now, the green groups now look as politically intimidating as the skinny kid on the beach who gets sand kicked in his face. The paper quoted a political analyst, uh, noting that, quote, this issue is starting to feel like Hillary health care uh, plan again. Despite the claims that we must act now to prevent climate uh, crisis, the climate tax bill would not have resulted in any action whatsoever. The bill, often touted as an insurance policy against global warming, would instead have been all economic pain and no climate gain. This is because without a global treaty, the binding commitments by both the developing and the developed countries is not going to work. You know, let, let's say that we believed that man-made gases, anthropogenic gases, were the major cause of climate change, and, it was, it was, and, the, and the, the, the debate was over. 
if we do something just unilaterally in the United States of America, all that will do is cause our flight of our, uh, of our manufacturing jobs overseas to countries like India and China and Mexico, places where they don't have any kind of a, uh, of a restriction on, the, on the, uh, the greenhouse gases. So it would have a net increase if we were to pass one of these, and yet we're the ones who would be saddled with a $300 billion a year tax bill. Americans are suspicious of the need for solutions to global warming. A Gallup poll re released on Earth Day, this is Earth Day 2008, revealed that the American public's concern about man-made global warming has remained unchanged since 1989. According to Gallup, and this is a quote now from the report, they said, despite the enormous attention paid to global warming over the past several years, the average American is in some ways no more worried about it than they were in years past. In other words, after all the money, all the hype, all the biased media uh, over the past few years, the people have, haven't moved in that direction. They know better. They know when they've been duped. What perhaps is the most striking is, the, is that aside from the economics of global warming solutions, the science has continued to move in the direction that I predicted in, in 2003. In 2007, I released a Senate minority report detailing over 400 scientists disputing man-made global warming claims and the inconvenient real-world climate developments refuting warmer fears. That was 2007, just, just a year ago. Now, in 2008, in the tail end of 2008, for the benefit of uh, the public uh, 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 dissemination, we have updated our report in the so-called consensus on global warming is even more in dispute. Over 650, that's the report that I have right here, 650 dissenting scientists from around the globe challenge man-made global warming claims made by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and by former uh, Vice President Al Gore. Our new 233 U.S. Senate Minority Report features the skeptical voices of over 650 prominent international scientists, including many uh, current and former U.N. IPCC scientists who have now turned against the U.N. Uh, IPCC. This updated report includes an additional 250 and growing, I might add, it's grown since then, a uh, number of scientists and climate researchers since the initial release in December of 2007. Uh, the over 650 dissenting scientists are more than 12 times the number of the UN scientists, only 52 of them, who authored the media-hyped IPCC 2007 summary for policymakers. This is very significant. I know this kind of is kind of heavy lifting here to to understand this, but the UN, the IPCC, that started this whole thing. They have these analyses that are made and are updated, but you never get the full report by any of the scientists. It's merely the summary for policymakers. That's us. That's for the politicians out there. And so they only have 52 scientists who signed this report. So we're talking about 650 scientists versus 52. The chorus of skeptical scientific voices grew louder in 2008 as a steady stream of peer-reviewed studies Analyses, uh, real-world data, and inconvenient developments challenged the UN's uh, and former Vi Vice President Al Gore's claims that the science is settled and there is no there is a consensus, despite what is now being portrayed in the media on a range of issues. 2008 proved to be devastating for the promoters of man-made climate fears. Now, in addition, the following developments further secure 2008 as the year of consensus collapsed. Uh, Russian scientists, re uh, quote now, uh, rejected the very idea that carbon dioxide may be responsible for global warming. Frankly, they laugh at it. I've had meetings with them. They laugh because I can remember back in Milan when they had one of their big United Nations meetings trying to coerce people, in, uh, countries into supporting this. The, the Russians at that time were in a position since they have so, they have these vast areas that are totally undeveloped. I remember a few years ago, I'm, I'm a pilot, and I flew an airplane around the world. And I remember going across Siberia and I'm looking down and seeing time zone after time zone. You don't see any people there. It's just nothing but natural resources. And yet all of those would go in the formula, so they would end up being great big recipients if they're able to uh, get some kind of an uh, international treaty. Well, the American, uh, in addition to that, the American Physical Society, Society editor conceded that a 
quote, considerable presence of scientific skeptics exists. An international team of scientists countered the UN IPCC declaring, quote, nature, not human activity, rules the climate. India issued a report challenging global warming fears. A team of international scientists demanded the UN IPCC, and I'm quoting now, be called to account and cease its deceptive practices. And a canvas of more than 51,000 Canadian scientists revealed that 68% disagreed that global warming science is settled. Now, now we're not talking about politicians, people, uh, senators like me and others in this room. We're talking about real scientists who are out there. We're talking about 68% of the scientists in, in Canada now have come around. That wasn't true five years ago. Most of them were on the other side of this issue. But they've now looked at it and realized that they've been duped. And so this new report is the latest uh, evidence of the growing groundswell of, of scientific opposition challenging significant aspects of the claims of the United Nations IPCC and Al Gore. Scientific meetings are now being dominated by a growing number of skeptical scientists. The prestigious International Geological Congress, dubbed by the geolog uh, geologists equivalent to the Olympic Games, held in very high esteem. They were talking about the International Geological Congress. It was held in Norway in August of 2008, just a few months ago, and prominently featured the voices of scientists skeptical of man-made global warming fears. The conference was reportedly overwhelmed with skeptical scientists, with two-thirds of presenters and question askers were hostile to even dismissive of the United Nations IPCC. Even the mainstream media in 2008 began to take notice of the expanding number of scientists serving as consensus busters. A November 25th, 2008 article in Politico, we're all familiar with Politico, everyone here in Washington reads it, noted that a growing accumulation of science is challenging warming fears and added that science behind global warming may still be too shaky to warrant cap and trade legislation. Canada's National Post noted on October the 20th, 2008, that the number of climate change skeptics, those who, who disagree with the idea that the science is settled, is growing rapidly. New York Times environmental reporter Andrew Revkin noted on March the 6th, 2008, quote, as we all know, climate science is not a numbers game. There are heaps of signed statements by folks with advanced degrees on all sides of this issue. And I agree with him. It's not. It's a. It's a shame that we shame that we have to had to resort to a numbers game. It should be focused on objective, transparent, and peer-reviewed science. And debate should not be quarantined. In 2007, the Washington Post staff writer Juliet uh, Ilprin uh, conceded the obvious, writing that climate skeptics quote appear to be expanding rather than shrinking. Skeptical scientists are gaining recognition despite what many say is a bias against them in parts of the scientific community and are facing significant funding advantage, disadvantages. Dr. William M. Biggs, a climate statistician who serves on the American Meteorological Society's Probability and Statistics Committee, explained that his colleagues described described, and we're talking about other, other meteorologists described, and he's quoting now, I'm quoting, absolute horror stories of what happened to them when they tried getting papers published that explored non-consensus views. In other words, the intimidation is out there. The threats are out there. In, in March 4th of 2008 uh, report, Biggs described the behavior as, quote, really outrageous and unethical on, on the parts of some editors. I was shocked. Again, this is not me saying this. These are the scientists. Here are some of the highlights of the, 19, of the 2008 Senate Minority uh, feature, a report featuring over 650 international scientists descending from man-made climate claims. Incidentally, this report that I have right here, it was my intention to make this report of these 650 scientists as a part of the record. However, very wisely, this body has said, you know, we don't want to, the expense of something like this would be so overwhelming that uh, some of us who are conservatives would rather not do it. So the report is here. It's a matter of public record. You can get a lot of this on my website. Uh, what is my website anyway? Yeah. epw.senate.com. 
Now, here are some highlights of that report. Nobel Prize, uh, Prize, Nobel Prize winner for physics, uh, Ivar Giver, stated, and I'm quoting now, I am a skeptic. Global warming has become a new religion. Atmospheric scientist jo uh, Dr. Joanne Simpson, the first woman in the, wor woman in the world to receive a Ph.D. in meteorologist and formerly of NASA, who has authored more than 190 studies, has been called among the most preeminent scientists in the last 100 years. She stated, quote, since I am no longer affiliated with any organization nor receiving any funding, I can speak quite frankly. As a scientist, I remain skeptical. The main basis of the claim that man's release of greenhouse gases is the cause of warming is based almost entirely upon climate models. We all know the frailty of models concerning the air surface system, unquote. Now here, no one can argue with, with Dr. Joanne Simpson. Uh, the uh, the U United Nations IPCC Japanese scientist, uh, Dr. Kimin Orotoi, an award-winning Ph.D. environmental scientist, chemist, he stated, uh, this is from all over the world now, this is from Japan, warming fears are the worst scientific scandal in history. When people come to know what the truth is, they will feel deceived by science and scientists. Uh, Indian geologist Dr. Arun uh, uh, Aluwale of Punjab University and a board member of the UN uh, supported International Year of the Planet stated, quote, the IPCC has actually become a closed circuit. It doesn't list to, uh, listen to others. It doesn't have open minds. I'm really amazed that the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize has been given on scientifically incorrect conclusions by people who are not geologists. Solar f physicist Dr. Blake Beckel, senior advisor at, to the Norwegian Space Center in Oslo, has published more than 40 peer-reviewed scientific articles on the sun and solar interaction uh, with, the, with the Earth. Brecky said, and I'm quoting now, anyone who claims that the debate is over and that conclusions are firm has a fundamentally unscientific approach to one of the most momentous issues of our time. These are all top scientists. No one can discredit these people. You might wonder, you know, why is it that uh, so many uh, people want us to believe that man-made, bad old man is responsible for these horrible things that they think are going to happen that are not going to happen? And there's a lot of reason for that. A lot of the money that's behind this or, uh, it comes from organizations like the we find in some of the, the Hollywood groups, the MoveOn.orgs, the George Soros, and the different foundations like the Heinz Foundation, who really do want to stop progress in this country. But anyway, back to some of these. Dr. Uh, uh, Victor Manuel Valesco Herrera is a researcher of the Institute of Geophysics uh, of the National Autonomous University of Mexico. I'm covering all these countries now. These are the top scientists in these countries. He stated, quote, the models and forecasts of the United Nations IPCC are incorrect because they only are based on mathematical mod models and presented results at scenarios that do not include, for example, solar activity. You know, surprise, surprise, the sun warms things. Uh, U.S. government uh, uh, atmospheric scientist Stanley Goldberg, Goldenberg of the Hurricane Research Division of NOAA stated, it is a blatant lie to put forth in the media that makes it seem that there is only a fringe of scientists who don't buy into anthropogenic global warming. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Duffy, a professor of the, uh, the Department of Chemical and uh, Materials Engineering of the University of uh, Auckland in New Zealand, stated, quote, even doubling or tripling the amount of carbon dioxide will virtually have little impact as water vapor and water can condensed on particles as clouds dominate the worldwide uh, scene are always and always will. In other words, this has always happened. You know, we, we've gone through these stages, and I, I don't want to make this a part of my without the documentation, but when we went through one of the other uh, warming periods in this country, it was back before they had the combustible, uh, combustible engine. It's back before CO2 was even around. And, and yet, uh, here we are today with all of these people. These are the top scientists in the world that are making these statements. And a lot of them are mad. And a lot of them we used to be on the other side of this issue. And that was back when they were being threatened by withdrawal of various 
funding for their uh, uh, the projects that they had, and now they're back on the other side. Andre Kavsita, a uh, Russian geographer and art Antarctic ice core researcher, stated, quote, the Kyoto theorists have put the cart before the horse. It is global warming that triggers higher levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, not the other way around. A large number of critical documents submitted at the 1995 uh, United Nations conference in Madrid uh, vanished without a trace. As a result, the discussion was one-sided and heavily biased. And the United Nations declared global warming to be a scientific fact. Prominent Hungarian uh, uh, physicist and environmental researcher, Dr. Miklos Zagardi, reversed his view. He was on the other side of this issue of man-made warming and is now a skeptic. Zargoni, uh, once uh, Hungar Hungary's most outspoken supporter of the Kyoto Protocol, stated uh, nature's regulatory instrument is water vapor. More carbon dioxide leads to less moisture in the air, keeping the overall uh, greenhouse gases content in accord with the necessary balanced conditions. Uh, again, that's very prominent, perhaps the, considered the most prominent scientist in, in Hungary. Geologist uh, Dr. David G the chairman of the Science Committee of the 2008 Intergovernmental Geological Congress, who has authored 130-plus peer-reviewed papers and is currently at uh, Uppsala University in Sweden, stated, quote, for how many years must the planet cool before we begin to understand that the planet is not warming? For how many years must cooling go on? Meteorologist, me meteorologist uh, Hajo Smith of Holland who reversed his belief, he was another one on the other side of this issue, another one of the many scientists that we list, uh, who reversed his belief in man-made warming to become a skeptic, is a former member of the Dutch UN IPCC committee. He stated, quote, Gore prompted me to start delving into the science again, and I quickly found myself solidly in the skeptical camp. Climate models can at best be useful for explaining climate changes after the fact, unquote. South Africa, nuclear physicist and chemical engineer Dr. Philip Lloyd. He was also one of them that was very prominent in the United Nations IPCC in the years past. He uh, co-coordinated co uh, lead author who was authored uh, over, who has authored over 150 referred uh, publications, stated, quote, the quality of CO2 we produce is insignificant in terms of natural circulation between air, water, and soil. I am doing a detailed assessment of the UN IPCC reports and the summaries for policymakers identifying the way in which the summaries have distorted the, the science. I'm anxious to get that report. You know, as we've said, we've been looking at these summaries for policymakers for a long time, and those people on the other side would have you believe that that is the National Academy of Scientists, that is, and that is the uh, United Nations. It's not scientists. This is a summary for policymakers. These are politicians who want to have an agenda. Atmospheric uh, physicist uh, uh, Dr. James A. Peden, uh, Peden, formerly of the Space Research and Coordination Center in Pittsburgh, stated, quote, many scientists are now searching for a way to back out quietly from promoting warming fears without having their professional careers ruined. This is the intimidation I was talking about. Uh, geophysicist Dr. Phil Chapman, an astronomical uh, engineer and former NASA, NASA astronaut who served as staff physicist at MIT uh, stated, all those urging action to curb global warming need to take off the blinkers and give some, throughout, uh, some thought to what we should do if we are facing global cooling instead, which incidentally happens to be going on right now. Environmental scientist Professor Delgado Domingos of Portugal the founder of the Numerical Weather Forecast Group, who has more than 150 published articles. These guys are smart guys. This is not politicians talking. These are the, 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 the incontrovertible uh, scientists that cannot be challenged. He stated, uh, quote, creating an ideology pegged to carbon dioxide is a dangerous nonsense. The present alarm on climate change is an instrument of social control, a pretext of major businesses and political battle. It became an, ide an ideology which is concerning. Uh, 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 Dr. Kuniko, 
uh, the Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Science and Technology Research at Chubu uh, University in Japan stated, uh, quote, uh, CO2 emissions make absolutely no difference one way or another. Every scientist knows this, but it doesn't pay to say so. Global warming as a political vehicle keeps Europeans in the driver's seat and developing nations walking barefoot. Award-winning paleontologist Dr. Eduardo Tony of the Committee for Scientific Research in Buenos Aires, the head of the paleontology department at the University of La Plata, said, quote, the global warming scaremongering has its justification in the fact that it is something that generates funds. There we go again. All these different groups around, these foundations who will fund people who will, want to, who will agree to uh, support their political positions. Atmospheric scientist Dr. Art V. Douglas, former chair of the Atmospheric Scientist Department at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, and author of numerous papers for uh, peer-reviewed publications, stated, whatever the weather, it's not being caused by global warming. If anything, the climate may be startling to, uh, starting into a cooling period. And this, by the way, is something that nobody questions now. They are, we are going uh, well into a cooling period. Chemist Dr. Uh, Patrick Frank, who has authored more than 50 peer-reviewed articles, stated, quote, but there is no uh, falsifiable scientific basis whatever to assert this warming is caused by human-produced greenhouse gases because current physical theory is too uh, grossly inadequate to establish any cause at all. Award-winning NASA astronaut and geologist, the moonwalker, Jack Schmidt, who flew on the Apollo 17 mission and formerly of the Norwegian Geological Survey and the U.S. Geological Survey, he stated, quote, the global warming scare is being used as a political tool to increase government control over American lives, incomes, and decision-making. It has no place in society's activities. By the way, I'd have to add to that another one of the motivations of the United Nations. They're always critical of us when we threaten to withhold some of the funding when they are advocating policies that are contrary to our policies in the United States would love nothing more than to have some type of, an, uh, of a funding mechanism where they didn't have to be accountable to the United States or any other nations. Climatologist Dr. Richard Keene of the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Scientists at the University of Colorado stated, quote, Earth has cooled since 1998. In defiance of the predictions by the UNIPC, see, the global temperatures for 2007 was the coldest in, the, in a decade in the coldest of the millennium. Uh, which is why global warming is now called climate change. This is kind of interesting. Uh, next week, uh, I'm, I'm going to put together what has been happening recently in this cooling period and the fact that we've had records that are set all around the United States and all around the world. And that's exactly what Dr. Richard Keene is, is talking about now. We are in a cooling period. It just has to drive these global warming people nuts to, to have to recognize that. Dr. G. LeBlanc-Smith, a retired principal research scientist with Australia's CSIRO, stated, quote, I have yet to see credible proof of carbon dioxide driving climate change, yet alone man-made CO2 driving it. The atmospheric hotspot is missing. The ice core data refuted this. When will we collectively awake from this deceptive delusion? That was Dr. LeBlanc-Smith of uh, Austria is one of the top scientists in Austria. Australia, I'm sorry. The distinguished scientists featured in this new report are excerpts in uh, diverse fields, including climatology, geology, biology, glaciology, bio, uh, geography, meteorology, and ocean, uh, oceanography, economics, chemistry, mathematics, environmental scientists, atmos uh, astrophysics, engineering, physics and paleo, paleo, uh, paleo climatology. Uh, some of those profiled have won Nobel Prizes for their outstanding contribution to their field of expertise, and many shared a portion of the UN IPCC Nobel Peace, uh, uh, Peace Prize with Al Gore. The notion of hundreds or thousands of UN scientists agreeing to a scientific statement does not hold up to scrutiny. Just, it's just not true. Uh, recent research by Australian climate data analyst uh, John McLean revealed that the IPCC's peer-reviewed process for the summary for policymakers leaves much to be desired. 
The 52 scientists who participated in the 2007 IPCC Summary for Policymakers had to adhere to the wishes of the United Nations political leaders and delegates in a process described as more closely resembling a political party's convention platform battle, not a scientific process. And I repeat, only 52 scientists wrote the media-hyped uh, UN summary for policymakers, and they were not, the, it was actually published by the politicians, not the scientists. One former UN IPCC uh, scientist bluntly told EPW, the Environment and Public Works, our committee, how the United Nations IPCC summary for poly policymakers destroyed, distorted the scientists' work. He said, and this is before our committee, he said, I have found examples of a summary saying precisely the opposite of what the scientists said. He explains the, explained the South African nuclear physicist and chemical engineer, Dr. Philip Lloyd, a UN IPCC coordinating lead uh, who authored uh, over 150 uh, referred publications. Uh, the t a 2008 international report of UN found its climate uh, energy rife with bad practices. Others like to note that the National Academy of Sciences and the uh, American Meteorological Society have issued statements endorsing the so-called consensus view that man is driving uh, global warming. But both the NAS and the AMS never allowed member scientists to directly vote on these climate statements. Essentially, only two dozen or so members of the governing bodies of these institutions produced a consensus statement. This report gives a uh, voice to the rank-and-file scientists who were shut out of the process. So they're very thankful. There are many of these scientists now are really glad that we have, uh, have this report so that they now have access to the truth and they can come out from, uh, from hiding. The more than 650 scientists expressing skepticism after the UN uh, IPCC chairman um, uh, uh, Pacharli implied that there were only about a dozen, this is what they were saying, only about a dozen skeptical scientists left in the world. Former uh, Vice President uh, Gore has claimed that scientists skeptical of climate change are akin to the Flat Earth Society members and similar in, in number to those who believe that the moon landing was actually staged in a movie lot in Arizona. It's a shame that proponents have now been reduced to name calling. And that's what we're getting now, just name calling and insults. When you lose your logic, this is what happens. They start uh, uh, the name calling and the insulting because they don't have logic on their side. Examples of consensus claims made by promoters of man-made climate fears. The UN Special Climate Envoy, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Harlem uh, uh, Brundtland on May 10th, 2007 declared the debate is over and added it's completely immoral even to question the UN scientific consensus. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Executive Secretary uh, said it was criminally irresponsible to ignore the urgency of global warming, and this is in the night in the November uh, 12th of 2007. ABC News global warming reporter Bill Blackmore reported on August 30th of 2006. After extensive re uh, searches, ABC News has found no such scientific debate on global warming. Now, while the dissenting scientists contained in this or in the report hold a diverge, uh, diverse range of views, they generally rally around several key points. Four key points. Number one, the Earth is currently well within natural climate variability. They agree with that. Now, we're talking about 650 of the top scientists in the world. Number two, almost all climate fear is generated by unproven computer model predictions. Number three, an abundance of peer-reviewed studies continue to debunk rising uh, CO2 fears. And number four, consensus, in quotes, has been manufactured for political and not scientific purposes. Now, those four things, all of these 650 top scientists in the world agree to. Now, since I released the report on December 7th, other scientists have contacted us to be included. On December 22nd, 11 more scientists were added, including meteorologists from Germany, the Netherlands, and CNN, I might add, even CNN, very much on the other side of this issue, for obvious reasons. Uh, two more of their meteorologists have come over and become skeptics, as well as professors from MIT, the University of Arizona, and other uh, institutions. One prominent scientist added, 
uh, was award-winning Princeton University physicist Dr. Will Happer, who was reportedly fired by former uh, Vice President, uh, President Al Gore in 1993 for failing to adhere to Gore's scientific views. Happer was, uh, has now declared man-made global warming fears as mistaken. Happer is a professor at the Department of Physics at Princeton University and former uh, director of energy research at the Department of Energy who has published over 200 scientific papers and is a fellow of the American Physical Society. The American Association of the Advancement of Scientists and the National Academy of Scientists. Happer does not mince words when it comes to warming, warming fears. He said, quote, I am convinced that the current alarm over carbon dioxide is mistaken. Fears about man-made global warming are unwarranted and are not based on good science, Happer declared. As we face a new administration and a UN eager to draw the U.S. into a climate policy, let's not forget that this aspect of the debate is still alive and well and only growing. We should not become weary of, of calling into question policy choices when they have, are driven by still evolving scientific assessments, especially when the stakes are so high and the costs are so extraordinary. Let us hope this administration and, and our news media recognize this new reality as we move forward into the, uh, this new Congress. Uh, on a personal note, I have to say this in concluding, it's, it's been a lonely fight. Uh, for the last six years, I've been talking about the Hollywood and media-driven fear on the Senate floor that tries to convince us that those who are fueling this machine uh, called America are somehow evil and fully responsible for global warming. Uh, this is absurd. We all know better, and it takes the power. You know, it does take power to run this machine we call America. In the past, the only argument that uh, uh, defeated the, uh, all the cap-and-trade schemes that was the economic argument. Uh, I think you can argue each one differently, saying, no, this wouldn't cost the same as adhering to the emissions required by Kyoto back in, in the Kyoto Treaty days. But any time you get into a cap-and-trade of, of CO2, it's going to cost about $300 billion annually in taxes. You know, I was critical of my colleagues, 75 senators on this Senate floor voted to give an unelected bureaucrat, uh, Secretary Paulson, $700 billion to do with as he wished with no oversight. I was very critical of that. Of course, that's a one-shot deal. This is every year. $300 billion annual tax increase was too much, even if the science was fully settled. Now, the science is shifting and shifting dramatically to the other side. So I, I really believe that we need to be looking, even if we use their own figures of the $6.7 trillion of the cost of the, of the life of a similar bill to the Lieberman-Warner bill. So let's conclude by repeating something I've said many times in the Senate floor. Even if you believe this, if you believe that man-made gases is a major cause of climate change, if you believe this, what good would it do for us unilaterally here in the United States of America to impose this financial hardship, $300 billion a year, on people here in the United States, when all that would do, logically, all that would do is cause our manufacturing base to further erode and go to countries like China and like India and like Mexico, other countries that have no emission re uh, restrictions at all. So it would be a $300 billion tax on us every year, and it would have the effect of increasing the net amount of, of emissions worldwide. So I think as we move into this year, uh, last year I didn't really say very much about the science. In fact, when we had the Lieberman-Warner bill up, I made the statement and we made it very clear. Let's assume for the debate of this bill that, that there, the science is all there and that it's settled. Then I just pursued the economic argument. This, the other side didn't like this because they wanted to debate the science. I said, no, let's assume you're right. You're not, but let's assume you're right. Still, this is something that we uh, uh, could not afford, and it's something that once people realize the cost. Sometimes we throw around big figures. I often have said this $700 billion bailout that I oppose, that uh, 75 senators voted for. If you stop and realize the number of taxpaying or of families who file a tax return, uh, and do your math, this comes to $5,000 a family. Well, if you look at this, this would be over $2,000 a family every year. So we want to be sure we're right if we do something. Let's go forward. Let's look at it. But let's pay attention more than anything else at this time, not just to the economics of this, but the fact that without doubt that the science is shifting. This report, this report of 650 of the top scientists 
and growing every day is very conclusive in my mind that uh, many of those individuals who are on the other side of this issue are now standing up to the intimidation and coming over and have become skeptics. So with that, uh, Mr. President, I yield the floor.